Modern. 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 We're prepping for a voyage. Modern. The force of an old fashioned equals whiskey mass times bitters acceleration. Why don't you make that a double? Modern Bar Cart. What's shaking, cocktail fans? Welcome to episode 251 of the Modern Bar Cart Podcast. I'm your host, Eric Koslick. Thanks for joining me for another interview episode where we track down the best and brightest minds in the spirits and cocktail world so that we can share their secrets with you. This time around, I'm joined by Ian Leggett and Alex Hildebrandt, the co-founders of Suyo Pisco, a company that celebrates the unique flavors of lesser-known Pisco producers from all around Peru. They're on a mission to highlight distillers that use single grape varietals all grown in a single place, really magnifying and bottling a sense of terroir. But before we talk about this fascinating spirit from one of the world's most biodiverse places, I'm going to send you off on your own mission to make yourself a drink. This episode's featured cocktail is the El Capitan. To make it, you'll need one and a half to two ounces of Pisco, one to one and a half ounces of vermouth, and a couple of dashes of aromatic bitters. Combine these ingredients in a mixing glass with ice, give them a good thorough stir about 15 seconds so that everything is well chilled and properly diluted, then strain into your favorite stemmed cocktail glass, garnish with a citrus twist, and enjoy. A couple interesting things came up as I researched the Capitan. First off, the original instantiation of this drink was likely a scafa, which is any cocktail made and served without using ice. So a simple mixture of brandy and vermouth, and you're off to the races. Second, there are as many ways to make a Capitan as there are a Manhattan. You can go with a classic two to one ratio of spirits to modifier. You can opt for a 50-50 version, which is actually what Alex and Ian recommend on their website. Or you can do what I would automatically think if you ask me to make a Manhattan with a clear, unaged spirit, which is to add equal parts dry and sweet vermouth to jack the drink with a little bit of extra acidity. This would be your perfect Manhattan rendition. And like most stirred cocktails, when it comes to bitters, the sky is pretty much the limit when it comes to experimentation. So now that you've got a fun new Manhattan riff to try next time you pick up a bottle of Pisco, let's turn our attention back to the interview. In this viticultural conversation with Pisco nerds and entrepreneurs, Alex Hildebrandt and Ian Leggett, some of the topics we discuss include... How two born and bred Peruvians met and became friends in the world of American corporate finance, then turned their sights on celebrating the flavors and aromas of their beloved home country. What it means for a distillate to be single origin, and how Ian and Alex went off the beaten path to find and partner with Pisco producers who are making truly remarkable spirits. How to think about Peru's fascinating geographic indication for Pisco, also known as its denomination of origin, which specifies what materials can be used, where grapes can come from, and even how many times it can be distilled. Then we taste through Suyo's inaugural offerings, a fruity complex quebranta made in the foothills of the Andes, and a sea-swept Italia bursting with floral and mineral complexity. Along the way, we cover the thorny topic of purity in different types of spirits, the age-old controversy of Chilean versus Peruvian Pisco, a potentially record-setting Pisco Sour performance by Ernest Hemingway, and much, much more. One thing we get into that I'd like you to particularly pay attention to in this interview is the notion of terroir, because if you spend any significant amount of time in the spirit space, this is a term that people are constantly trying to jam down your throat as a value proposition. And it's a real thing, but it's a notion that's gotten more and more watered down in recent years. Luckily, we're here to set all that straight. So please enjoy this fascinating chat with Ian Leggett and Alex Hildebrandt of Suyo Pisco. Ian, Alex, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having us, Eric. Good to meet you. Thanks, Eric. Great meeting you. So let's kick this off by just doing some introductions here. And, uh, you know, we always start with, with an introduction, but because we have two of you, uh, it would be interesting not only to hear who you are and what you do, but also maybe give us a little backstory uh, about how you met. So I'll have Alex start. 
Sure. Yeah, that sounds great. Um, so, uh, I am, uh, so I'm from Peru originally and I moved to the U S when I was about three, was three years old and I've lived in the U S most of my life. And, um, I, uh, spent a career prior to this. So I grew up in the Midwest and then I spent a career sort of in the, in the corporate world between uh, a couple different things, mergers and acquisitions and working in uh, corporate strategy and, and development in the, in the healthcare space, which is where I actually met Ian in, um, geez, about several years ago now. And uh, he and I became good friends and um, he moved back. I'll let him tell you a little bit more about that, but uh, he moved back a few years ago and he and I kept in touch and we always, uh, the entire time we've known each other, we've talked about doing something together. And uh, when we tell you a little bit more about the brand story, we'll let you know how it all came together. But um, spent most of my life in the U.S. from Peru originally, and uh, that's how I how I met Ian. Awesome, Ian. Yeah, similar story to Alex's. Um, I actually grew up in Peru, lived there most of my life until I was eighteen. Eighteen, I, I went and um, studied in the states up in upstate New York, and then I moved to Boston, and that's where I did some healthcare consulting, which is where. I mean, if there's two Peruvians in the building, they'll meet each other, right? So that's where <laughs> I met Alex. <laughs> and uh, I just started just bonding over a common ground of Peru. And and then it all eventually rolled into what is now Suyo. Brilliant. So I, I guess the, the first question before we get into the story of that company is what does Suyo mean? Is it an acronym? Is it a word? What what should Suyo evoke ideally uh, in somebody who comes across a bottle of this beautiful clear distillate? Well, I, Suyo is a perfect combination of of two words that uh, ultimately are sort of pillars of what we define the brand as. Uh, so Suyo is a double entendre, and uh, for starters, it means region in the the Quechua language which is the language that uh, the, the Incas spoke and uh, the indigenous people today in Peru still speak, uh, mostly in, in more remote regions, but uh, it's still very commonly found. And there's actually been a good, uh, the government has had a lot of initiatives recently to uh, help promote learning of that language as it starts to disappear with Spanish, of course, being the primary language now uh, in Peru. So Suyo means uh, region, which is a nod to our single origin concept as we're introducing different Piscos part of our platform, they are going to be coming from from different vineyards, and we are highlighting terroir. So region is just a really good word to nod to that. And then at the same time, it means yours in Spanish. And that lends to sort of this concept of sharing, and we're trying to build a bridge between two different cultures, and uh, really more than just two, really trying to build a bridge from Peru to uh, the, the global market and vice versa. Uh, so we felt like it was really a fun combination between uh, that, that sort of encapsulates two concepts and uh, is easy to say, thankfully, because we we brainstormed a lot, brainstormed a lot of names when we were trying to come up with it. Is, is the Spanish, I guess, pronouny type thing, the, the yours aspect of it is, is the su yo, yo is I or me, right? And then Sue is like your, so it's like, is, is there like a, almost like a directionality of that yoursness of like, it's almost like being given as a gift or is that just, just not etymologically correct? Yeah, I, I think it has some component to that. It's, it's the formal way of saying tuyo, which is yours, right? Okay. Uh, it's just like the equivalent of the usted in Spanish, Got it. Uh, but it does Got mean it. Initially, it began as a nod to the producers. Like Alex and I see each other as as vehicles for these producers, so we always refer to the pisco as theirs, as suyo, right? Uh, it's uh, the pisco from the producers that we are building a bridge to the consumers and the rest of the world. Gotcha, gotcha. Well, so we have Suyo. We have two young Peruvian gentlemen who uh, met each other in sort of the corporate world here in the U.S. And what is the spark that grew into the fire that is this venture? Yeah, so maybe I, I can take a first first run at that, and Ian can can fill in any blanks. Well, so like I said, when Ian and I met, uh, was, we, we clicked pretty quickly as the only two Peruvians in in the work environment. And uh, funny story about that, uh, Eric, as I'm sure you observed early on, neither one of us have particularly Peruvian sounding names. 
So, uh, you know, we, we saw each other's names on, you know, different emails and whatnot, but, uh, we didn't know that that was the other, the other guy. And we passed each other in the hallway, uh, and also could not identify the other, the other guy. And then we happened to be at a work function, I think a few months after I joined the company because Ian was there before I was. And we both kind of, uh, I don't know, it's kind of like that, like that Spider-Man meme where we were both looking at each other, like, (laughs) oh, you're, you're that, you're that guy. Uh, so that was really funny. And then, uh, yeah, we just connected over that, you know, we'd go to each other's places, watch, uh, watch soccer games during world cup qualifying and stuff like that, go out for drinks. And, uh, in the spring of 2019, I was back in Peru visiting my family. So the majority of my family still lives in Peru. And, uh, Ian and I had been, you know, for years been talking about, uh, doing something together. Ian had already moved back to Peru and, uh, you know, we were always brainstorming things. And on this particular occasion, we just happened to be out on, uh, on, on a patio in Lima where Ian was living and where, uh, the capital city where most of my family lives. And, um, uh, you know, I, I think it was super organic. I don't know if it was me or him, or, you know, we were just talking about Pisco and we're, we're having a Capitan, which happens to be, uh, both of our favorite, I think cocktails. Uh, I think we have a number of favorite cocktails, but I, I think, uh, Capitan is definitely up there. And, um, we started sort of speculating as to why Pisco hadn't, hadn't really reached the level of success outside of Peru that of course it has within. So uh, I was actually leaving uh, for Peru, if not or leaving Peru, if not the next day, the day after that. So uh, I kind of went back to the States with this idea in my mind. And um, we, we talked about it, if not every day, every other day and sort of bounce ideas off each other. And then uh, I said, we need to investigate this further. So naturally a few weeks later, I flew down to Peru and, we, uh, geez, we must have over the course of the next six or seven months, thankfully this was before the pandemic. So we could travel. I was, uh, yeah, I went back to Peru probably six or seven times and we must have met 50 plus different, uh, vineyards, distilleries, uh, families, you know, people in and around the space. And we, uh, we, we pretty quickly realized that what we wanted to do was not just uh, so, so we obviously loved the spirit we always had, and we even fell more in love with the process. So uh, after my first or second visit, we were like, we definitely want to do this. Now let's figure out what's the best way to do it. We then realized that we felt like the best Pisco we were finding was at these uh, hard to reach vineyards in hard to reach areas that uh, are from producers who don't really have access to uh, the the main Pisco producing region of, of Ica, let alone a few hours north to the capital city of Lima, let alone outside of Peru, you know, to the United States, forget about it. So uh, we just didn't feel like there was much, much soul. And if we were just to go try to do a private label or something. So we decided let's, let's build relationships with these producers and set up uh, a collaborative with them so that uh, ultimately, we're highlighting their Pisco under the Suyo name. So we're sort of the, 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 the leaders who bring everything together and, and bottle it, but they are the ones who are producing the Pisco and we're giving them access to a market. And uh, at the same time, we're giving consumers access to Pisco that otherwise we just feel like they wouldn't uh, have an opportunity to try. That, that's kind of the, 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 short, the short version of it. Yeah, ultimately, it was just, uh, I would say Suyo at the beginning was... A, a concept. Ian and I have always wanted to do something that bridges both of our countries. Pisco happens to be the the vehicle that we we chose because we always knew we loved Pisco. There's nothing more Peruvian than Pisco, and then we fell more in love with it as we dug deeper. Because Ian and I don't don't come from this industry, so we've been you know kind of learning as we go. But that's been part of what's been super fun about this is we're you know about four years into the project, and we feel like we've learned so much, but there's so much learning we we still need to do. So yeah, it's 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 a it's a fun discovery mission. It's kind of how we how we describe what we do. It's a Pisco discovery project. Mm. And just to add a little bit of more context there, Eric, uh, the I think the one stat that made us focus on the model that we have right now is when we were building this out in the beginnings, we found a document that listed all the denomination of origins in Peru. So all the producers that can actually make Pisco. And there were 526 of them that were allowed to make Pisco through the denomination of origin. And you go to the local supermarket in the capital city, you maybe find 20. You go to the U.S. and you maybe find four or five. So 
that got us Alex and I obviously thinking, where are the other 500 producers that are making this amazing spirit, probably not in a commercial or large scale, but are still making it. And that's when it kind of transitioned into, okay, let's call a big company that makes Bisco and tell them, hey, let's slap a label on it and, and sell it. And it turned more into, let's try to meet all these other people that are making Bisco and nobody knows about. Uh, mm. So that, that kind of, we definitely took the harder approach because it takes a lot of time of, of visiting vineyards, but it's definitely one that has fulfilled us personally the most because it, it also allows us to reconnect with, with areas of Peru and Lima that we didn't even know before we started doing this. Yes. And I, I am very excited to speak with both of you gentlemen about terroir because on the one hand, I think we're at a moment in time where the concept of terroir in the spirits world is not very exciting anymore. People are almost um, like exhausted by how many brands are have just been hammering. It's it's almost like you know when you listen to music at a loud volume for a long enough time, you start to go a little bit deaf. And I feel like that's the case with certainly a number of American markets when it comes to that notion of terroir. On the other hand, one of the reason, and our regular listeners will certainly know this about me, that I love so dearly grape distillates, especially unaged grape distillates, is that I think that they are one of the purest possible expressions of terroir. You have almost this sliding continuum where at one end, and Alex, I, I listened to an interview you did earlier today as I was doing some research for this, and you were talking a lot about agave spirits, tequila, mezcal. And on the on the one end of that spectrum, you have these agave plants that are sitting in the soil and soaking up terroir for 20 years sometimes before their harvest. And, and that's one really intense aspect of terroir. And then weirdly enough, you go far enough in another direction and you hit China and Baijiu, and it's almost a microbiological terroir where they, they're tending these, these weird fermentation pits with chew that have been active and making baijo since Shakespeare was alive. And that's another type of terroir. It's like a microbiological and kind of like cultural terroir. And then in the middle, you have grapes. And while they're not in the ground as long as agave, and they don't have as much of that sort of micro manipulation over time as like some of the, some of the funky Asian ferments, they they have this really special kind of annual cyclical opportunity, which is, okay, every year we have a great harvest. Every year we do all the best parts of the thing that, like all the best parts of what we did the year before. And then maybe we make this little, like a little notch of progress that, ooh, maybe, you know, we have an opportunity this year to try something slightly different and we get to sit and see what that little tiny, tiny micro adjustment, the impact that that had on this year's thing. And I, I view that as sitting right in the heart of that continuum of terroir. And so I, I would love for you to talk about some of the constraints that you set for the liquid that goes into your bottles because constraints are a, a large part of terroir. Maybe some of that plays into the notion I'm kind of setting you up here of, of Pisco as, as a very pure spirit. So I'd love to hear you talk about some of that. Yeah, terroir, Eric, you're totally right. It's a very overused word. And sometimes it's it's overused for the wrong reasons. It's um, everything should have an aspect of terroir, right? And, and all all spirits essentially come from, unless you go into the super molecular experimental ones, all spirits really come from nature and nature already imparts that terroir. Uh, we are living in a, in a time that um, we're, I call it the age of standardization, right? Where consumers equate quality to them buying a tequila that tastes the same year over year. Unfortunately, that's humans trying to control nature more than we should. Um, and if we lean away from that, we start encountering terroirs even in things where we didn't really think we could find terroir, right? So us using terroir is is really the, the way we define terroir is um, vineyard and producer, right? Terroir is the interaction between humans and nature. Nature is vineyard, soil, weather, the different organisms in the vineyard. Producer is their traditions in making the spirit, 
what degree they distill it to, what uh, spontaneous yeast are in their in their bodega, etc. And the marriage of those two creates your terroir, right? It's and to answer your question, what constraints do we put on that to ensure? I imagine you were referring to ensure a quality of um, a standard of quality that that we can continue or sustainably produce. Is we we evaluate a few things. On the first, our first filter is producer relationship. So we we like working with people that have a similar vision to us. That eventually we see this project as our family. So all the producers that we that we work with eventually form part of this family, right? So at the core of everything is trust in the producers. So now with our producers, we have a very, we have a, we've created a two way street where yes, they, they are the producers for the brand, but at the same time, we bring back technical knowledge from the market and from our learnings and tell them, as you were mentioning, Eric, okay, next year, maybe, maybe let's create a higher percentage P skill. Let's cut it at 43, not 42, because that's kind of what the market is looking for, you know, or this year, for example, we, as part of a program that we, that we're starting in the brand, we hired local uh, agriculturists to uh, do a vineyard diagnosis for both vineyards. So he analyzed the soil, the water, um, and created a, a plan of action for the vineyards. One vineyard needed a little uh, better drainage system, a root regrowth process that uh, that now the agriculturist is working with the with the vineyard to put into place. And that's part of that two way street, right? The, the idea is to um, for the producers to improve their practices uh, in the long run. Um, I think that the next filter is obviously organoleptic. Uh, it needs to taste well, you know, so terroir, y- you evaluate terroir and the taste of the final result. So we're looking for, uh, for notes that are, that are different, right? Uh, to, we're not trying to go for the standard Pisco. We're trying to go for more disruptive types of Pisco. You might like it. Uh, you might like one of them. You might not like the other one of them, but uh, our idea is to produce different types of Pisco and not necessarily say that we produce the best Pisco because there's there's no such thing. And the third component there is uh, physical chemical. So our Pisco samples before going to the States are analyzed uh, through gas spectroscopy. And uh, the results of that need to fall in line with what the denomination of origin defines as Pisco. You know, so certain levels of higher alcohols need to be within certain parameters needs to needs to have um, all of these pisco is at the end a combination of a lot of volatile substances uh, that impart the flavor and the taste to it so they need to be carefully guarded so that they fall within certain parameters um, and yeah that's that's about it I'd say if we boil it down it's those three those three um, uh, filters that we tend to use and, and I would just add real quick Eric I don't know if this Maybe uh, it gives a little bit more context to your question, but uh, as it relates to terroir, I think, you know, there, as you stated, I think this is such a broad term that, that many brands are using within the industry. There, there are so many ways that you can do this. And we focus uh, mostly on the, the, the raw material side of it. So as Ian said, you know, the, well, the grape itself, but that's because of, you know, due, due to the composition of the soil, the climate, the altitude, all these things, but then also from the yeast via spontaneous fermentation. These are things that, you know, the, the natural yeast, the ambient yeasts are impacting this fermentation. That's kind of like where terroir as it relates to Suyo is the most impactful. On the other hand, you have, I think brands in other categories that are either not denomination of origin controlled or are uh, simply have different controls, obviously. So you have the ability to impart flavorings such as botanicals and you can, you can have terroir that way, right? There are terroir gins for that reasons because of botanicals. And then uh, aging is another way you can do this with so many different categories based on where you source your wood. Of course, that's going to impact the way that your final distillate tastes. With Pisco, you're, you're simply not allowed to do that. And I think you use the word, Eric, pure. Uh, it's, it's for purity purposes. And that's part of what uh, is, is so beautiful about uh, the spirit and the denomination of origin. Of course, there are opposing sides to different DOs in different countries. But as it relates to the Peruvian one, I think uh, that's that's certainly one of the advantages is it allows us to always put forth the, the most purest, the most pure expression of the 
of the grape in a distillate form. Alex, sorry to jump in there, Eric. Just a quick point on what Alex was saying. Yeah. Got me all excited here. Um, Good. The the beauty about Pisco is that it'll it's as you were saying Eric it's it's a perfect vehicle to explore terroir because you can only distill it once and you can't dilute it with water right so every time you go into a distillation run you you lose some of those primary and secondary flavors and aromas from the from the base uh, material with Pisco you can only run it once and the, the ABV that you get is the ABV that you rest it at you can't dilute it so that's also a very important thing to note about Pisca and why it's a great vehicle for exploring different terroirs. Yeah, I I have a lot of very po- very positive feelings about the Peruvian denomination of origin for Pisco, and I find that when DOs come up in conversation, I tend to be very ornery. I, I don't like them. I think that they are, in many cases, anti-competitive. They stifle creativity. But for whatever reason, with Pisco and with Peru, I think they found this really beautiful spot where you can use, unlike, for example, like in, let, let's compare it to like the Bordeaux wine region, for example. Like if you're making a Bordeaux red, you can use like, two grapes, maybe there's like a, there's Merlot, Cab Sauve, and then there's a couple of little bastard grapes that you can throw in, but everybody knows if you throw those in, you're not going to be taken seriously. So you get two grapes to play with. With the Peruvian Pisco Dio, how many grapes do you have to play with? Eight. Eight. So, so eight, eight different grapes you can use. Yep. Right. And you have mentioned previously, either when we were chatting offline or on a, a previous interview that you've done, that Peru is just this tremendously biodiverse place. We know it as a place, you know, with the Andes, we've got, you know, um, Machu Picchu and like all these, all this, the Inca culture is, is so, it's so vertical. Like there's a lot of, there's a lot of altitude in there. And we know that you also have you know, the, the, the port of Pisco is a port. It's literally on the ocean. So you have a maritime climate, you have elevation. And then I'm sure like any other country in the temperate zone, you have variations in rainfall and, and, and all that stuff. So you have eight grapes, you have this tremendous variety of uh, geographic climatic conditions. And then you've got this single distillation rule. And to me, you know, it's it's interesting when you think about the notion of pure, because what is this process not like? Well, it's not like vodka, where you run it through a, a column still a bunch of times and you get it to taste as neutral as possible. But here's the thing: vodka people also use that word pure. And I think it's also relevant, but it seems to be a subtractive notion of the word pure and that like we're taking everything out all what you get is just like it is pure neutral or pure pure almost like um like it when you're meditating it's like you you try and get to that place of nothingness right like and and it's a positive sense of that but it seems like this single distillation constraint is a type of purity that's almost additive and that it's like all right like you're only going to run this through the pot still once and as a result we know that what is here is truly like the best expression of what this grape tasted like on the vine, kind of refined and almost, um, you know, put through a, an amplifier of sorts. Would that be, do you, how, do you, how do you think about that? The purest expression of nature maybe would be a, a good way to describe yeah. that. Yeah. Uh, well, I've got, number one here in a glass. It's been opening up for a couple of minutes here. Um, why don't you walk me through a tasting of the Suyo number one? I'm going to get, get right there with you. Okay. Mm. I mean, one thing I'm picking up automatically is that, uh, that pear skin aroma that I love from Pisco's. And for, for the viewers, this is a, uh, this is the 750. I apologize, Eric. I didn't have a chance to get you the 750 as I was traveling, but all, all uh, good. thankfully you you, re- you received the <laughs> received the package. Yep, we get, we got the uh, we got the lovely little samples here, and that's all we need for a podcast. Just a little sample. <laughs> yeah, maybe maybe I can run you through the what comes before the tasting, Eric, which is sure. which is where the where the piece comes from. 
Right yeah, now. please. So this pisco that you're smelling right now comes from Fundo La Esperanza, which is a vineyard that's 14 kilometers inside the Mala Valley. Uh, it's, a, it's a valley that's 90 kilometers south of Lima. So it's close to the capital city in a region that's commonly known for its pisco as well. And it's growing in popularity. It is at 100 meters above sea level. So it is at the beginning of the Andes mountain range, right? So you'll see mountains on both sides of the vineyards. And the beauty about this this vineyard is that it's at a perfect distance where it stops receiving a lot of the of the ocean breeze, which in the other vineyard that we partnered with is a very character a very specific characteristic to that to that pisco. It's the the ocean breeze that gives the minerality to the other vineyard. Uh, this vineyard is more nestled in the mountain range. Has uh, uh, the mountain range protect the uh, protect the vineyard from the afternoon and the evening suns, uh, and through the lack of ocean breeze and uh, the the heavy sunlight that you get during the hours of sun, you develop grapes that are a little bit smaller than the other vineyard, but are uh, are more concentrated in sugar. So a lot of those notes of pear and, and what I what I sometimes refer to as compote, like fruit compote, maybe peach compote, come from the from that um, from those grapes that are a little bit more concentrated in mm. sweetness. And through its fermentation and distillation process, you're able to isolate that flavor. Mm. I love I love when somebody says something and it I, I know I know it, it is in part the placebo effect, but <laughs> I, I got that peach as soon as you said it. Yeah, that that's lovely, and of and of course, you know, I, I started in wine as well, and one of the other things I love when speaking to people who distill grapes is that you get to revisit some of those very basic things, right? Which is that the more sun the grapes get, the sweeter they tend to be, smaller, sweeter, more concentrated. Whereas you know other grapes that receive less sun have opportunities to develop other things, and um, I yeah, I think that's I, I think knowing or assuming anyway that this is the first product that you put to market it seemed like a great opportunity to capture some of that essence because it is so unique and then you know you're going to have an opportunity to go and play with something entirely different just with the diversity of distillers that you were able to to touch base with yep this episode is brought to you by near country provisions Yep, you've heard me singing their praises for the past year now, and to answer a question I'm frequently asked, yes, I still do a little happy dance when my monthly subscription shows up at my door, on dry ice, and in an insulated bag. I want to highlight a couple aspects of Near Country that normally take the backseat to their meat quality and their impeccable local sourcing, those being affordability and customization. I don't know if you've been paying attention to the price of groceries lately, but the cost of meat, even the factory farm stuff, has been skyrocketing. But because Near Country keeps things local to the Mid-Atlantic, your meat doesn't have to travel far, and it doesn't change hands half a dozen times before it hits shelves, meaning you don't have to pay for all those markups from middlemen. Every time I do a price comparison between Near Country and the grocery store, I'm blown away by the quality that I'm getting relative to the cost. And when it comes to flexibility, I've never worked with a subscription service where I have so much control. Let's say, for example, that you've got something against pork chops. Every month, Adam and his team send around a survey that allows you to say, hey, I don't want pork chops this month. Or, I don't want pork chops ever again. Or, a more reasonable request, I'd love it if you could include pork chops in my delivery every month. Preferences change, diets change, and special requests and cuts are always on your mind at certain times of the year, and Near Country gets that. They bend over backwards to help meet your changing needs. Head over to nearcountry.com and enter the code BARCART, all one word, that's B-A-R-C-A-R-T, when you sign up for your subscription to receive two free pounds of bacon or ground beef in your first delivery. And believe me, you'll be glad that you did. Now back to the show. So when somebody tastes a Pisco and they're not used to tasting pisco. Let's say they're used to drinking grape-based distillates, but maybe they're more in like the cognac, perhaps a little bit of Armagnac, maybe some Calvados type things. 
what should somebody expect on the palate from a pisco? Are there are, are there any like quality indicators? Um, what 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 kind of sets either this product in the glass in front of us, or you know, what's a quality indicator that someone might experience in the wild when tasting? Yeah, uh, the first note to me that comes to mind is it, it should ha- it should be fresher than an Armagnac, than a Calvados, mm-hmm. right? It doesn't have that wood component. So you usually don't have much of, of the vanilla associated with the with the aged brandies. Um, I, I always look for the more fruity, citrusy uh, tastes in, in a Pisco. Mm-hmm. So you'll see that there is uh, probably more green fruit, more than any... Mm-hmm. Uh, any any more of red fruit or jams, you know, uh, less vanilla, definitely less tobacco or le- less leathery, you know, and more of more of the fresh fruits, um, the, the the bright citrus notes. Uh, I'd say I'd look for those. Mm. I definitely get a great. It's interesting. Generally, when you taste a spirit, you'll you'll get some some lighter notes up. Uh, on the aroma and then you go in and you'll kind of dive into some of those deeper notes here. I almost get some of the more perfumes, more, uh, what we would call sugary notes, pear, pear and peach aren't exactly sugary, but the sweeter notes. And then it almost gets greener as it passes over the palate I find here. And, um, it has almost, almost a cooling mouth feel like, of course there's an ethanol burn to it, but it's not like a hot, it's not like a hot mouthfeel. The, the finish is really compelling to me because it's almost energizing. Um, I don't know. I don't know if you get that impression ever. Yeah. It's uh, Alex, go, go for it. Yeah, no, sorry. I was, I was on mute and I trying to limit background noise as well. Um, yeah, I, I never want a, a Pisco to, uh, uh, be, I never want it to be sort of dull, like mm. like sometimes a uh, specific reds, uh, red wines might might help you feel. Um, uh, I'm looking for a little bit more pop, something that, as you said, energizing. Mm. It's uh, it, it it's it's invigorating. I almost feel like it's. Uh, I hate to be too like uh, mythical with this, but it's almost like a magical taste that I get when I'm sipping a good pisco. Sometimes you can get, particularly if. Uh, you know, I think we've had some piscos that are aged for a little bit too long and you get uh, less of that pop and it's a little bit more of a muted uh, mouth feel and, and, and almost get like sort of a raisiny aftertaste, which, which is good uh, depending on, on your flavor profile. But we, we like that sort of more invigorating mouth feel. Um, and uh, yeah, you know, I think this is, uh, it's funny, Ian and I joke about this because uh, tasting is such, it's such an intimate experience that we, we hate to send people in a certain de- uh, direction and tell them what they're supposed to be looking for. Of course, uh, there are broadly speaking things that we think are, are typical in certain Piscos, especially between the non-aromatics and the aromatics. We'll get to the aromatic next. But uh, by and large, we, we always hesitate to send anyone in a- any specific direction. We're, um, we're always interested in, in, in feedback uh, to, to see what other people taste in our Piscos as well. Yeah, that that leads to the the final two questions I was going to ask about number one, of of course the the grape varietal or varietals involved, and number two, you know, um, you know, we're talking about single distillations. I assumed, perhaps correctly, perhaps incorrectly, uh, a moment ago, uh, that they're all distilled in a pot still as opposed to a column still. Um, so, what grapes are in this number one, and do you have any um, any uh, specs on the type of still that's being used to uh to distill these yeah i I can go into these what we tried to do in each bottle is isolate one grape and from one vineyard right so in this bottle it's you're only tasting a quebranta which is the uh the most i guess the the least aromatic it's called the non-aromatic grape um so it's it's a grape that will have less of uh, an aroma but it has a very structured body Mm. Um, and it's only coming from Fundo La Esperanza, which is this vineyard that we that we were just talking about that's kind of nestled at the beginning of the Andes. Uh, in terms of the distillation, it is distilled in a copper alambic steel, which is uh, traditionally um, a still with Arabic influence that was used a lot in uh, in France, actually. And it's made out of entirely 
entirely copper. Uh, you have a type of gooseneck that sits above the capital, right? So you have the still, which is the, the pot, and then you have the the capital, which is a looks kind of like a hat, right? That is used to condense a lot of the uh, a lot of the vapors. The gooseneck, which then funnels all of the vapors into a coil that is cooled with water. And in this coil, what happens is the vapors condense into liquid, and then you get those liquid flowing out of the out of the still. And from then on, once the liquid is flowing out of the still, there's only two cuts that are made. So you start with your heads, cut it to remove all of the higher level alcohols that you don't want in your Pisco. Keep your heart, which is in its majority ethanol, but also contains a lot of the higher uh, alcohols that impart the flavors in Pisco. And then cut it when you start getting the, the aromas of your tails, right? Which is mostly water, fusel oil, acids. Um, and that's it. It's seemingly simple, but it's very complicated to to know what to cut, what temperature to to put into your still, how fast to heat up the still. Uh, so there's a lot of a lot of details there that that make it a very interesting art. Yeah, well, and I'm, I'm glad that you mentioned the alembic still because I do like in terms of the texture of this, uh, it does bear some similarities with Armagnac, and, and the alembic still is is of course a, a mainstay of Armagnac production. Um, so I think obviously we've got number one. The sort of heart of this conversation is all right, single origin. Let's let's take number two and see what the experience is, how it's similar to and different from number one. So we're gonna pour, I'm going to pour my sample of number two here. And um, why don't we go through the background of this second expression? Yeah. Um, and I'll, I'll just caveat that, Eric, saying that number two is a different grape. So not only does terroir affect the flavor, also the grape varietal does. It's it's. I would say the most aromatic of grape varietals, so you'll get a lot of floral, citrusy aromas in the notes. Uh, but this particular pisco is from a vineyard that's right next to the ocean, three kilometers inside. It's on a plain that is exposed to the ocean breeze, so you get a lot of um, of cool ocean breeze flowing into the vineyard. What this does, as, as with wines, is create a, creates a cooling effect around the grapes, which... Um, maintains the acidity at high levels and it creates a, a pisco that has a mineral backdrop to a certain extent, has a fresh mineral backdrop. It's a little bit drier. So that's what we really enjoyed about this one. And we also have an expression of the Quebranta grape, which is the one you tasted previously from this vineyard. Um, unfortunately, that one we're, we're still uh, commercializing in Peru at the moment. Um, but that one is... is the other side of the spectrum in Quebranta. It's a very minerally, very dry Quebranta. Well, the one you tasted was a sweet, um, mm. more fruit-forward Quebranta, right? Um, but focusing on on the Italia, which is the number two, it's, um, as I mentioned, an aromatic grape varietal has more more of a bouquet to it, um, if you may. Um, but I'll, I'll let you tell us what you thought. That's also, that's the same as the Muscat of Alexandria. Is that correct? It is that family. Gotcha. Same family. Gotcha. Um, yeah, it's, I, I mean, this is, it's beautiful guys. It's, um, <laughs> I know you didn't make it, but it's, I mean, this is, this is why I love Brandy. This is, it, it's, I, I'm getting on, on like Hulu and and all the streaming services right now, it's obviously we're approaching the holidays. So every ad that I get is, is a fragrance ad. And I feel <laughs> I, they're, they're the silliest ads because it's like, what, what are you trying to sell me? Like, I don't even know what, what this means, but this to me is like a fragrance ad in a glass. It's so beautiful and feminine and, um, floral and then on the palate like you know this is it's so wonderful to taste this side by side with the quebranta because you really do get the sense that they're two different animals almost you know one has this sweetness and structure and 
you know, you, you almost, you almost have an inverse experience here where you you're smelling this floral, just, just explosion of sweet floral notes on the, on the nose and almost like, like melon notes, like sweet, like I'm thinking like honeydew melon it's, and then on the palate, you, you're right. You get that, like that almost bracing, refreshing minerality and acidity. And it's just, it's a, it's a wonderful one, two punch. And for cocktails, which is something we should probably get into, I can imagine that this would be a huge favorite for bartenders because what's better than having that kind of offset aroma flavor experience? I mean, like that, that's really where you can, can zero in and create some truly amazing cocktails. So, um, two, two things, uh, all spot on most, mostly spot on, um, t- t- two things, uh, one, Yes, we did not create it, but we'll accept 0.1% of the credit because we because we tasted it and selected it. Yeah. 0.1% because the rest of the credit obviously goes to the, the people we want to highlight the most is the producers. So I'm, I'm glad you do say that. Um, and then uh, number two is I'm not going to let you box us into the feminine. I feel very masculine when I drink this myself personally. As, as do <laughs> Only I. Joking. As do I. Only joking. As do I. Um, but but you, know, you know what I'm saying though? Like there's certain archetypes, right? Like of there's course. certain archetypes that spirits embody and it's just it's it's useful like you can also think of it as like the orchestral thing right so this is this is like the woodwind section and then you know the uh the the quebranta grape is maybe you know some of the some of the deeper strings or something like that like the cello or something that's providing like a different it's vibrating at a different frequency and i think that's it's of course useful in what you're doing because i see obviously you know, for people who might not have as much experience in the straight spirits categories, I do, you see a lot of this in coffee, in chocolate, like there's a lot of single origin stuff on the shelves. And I think that's what single origin is best at is saying like, "Mm, yeah, this isn't just like everything else on the shelf. You're only going to be able to get this flavor with this thing. Um, But, you know, I'm, I'm wondering now that we've gotten sort of like the We've got the two points make a line. We've got the trajectory of like, ah, this is what it's supposed to be like when I sample a selection of Suyo products. How do you envision this kind of expanding over time? Are you looking more towards different grape? I mean, you've obviously still got six grapes left. You know, are you thinking of of knocking out the grapes next? Or are you going to be trying to um, like bring some more of these producers into the fold to feature them? How does this look like, you know, as you envision more of these bottles, um, you know, potentially rolling out to market? Yeah. Um, I, I think that's, that's a, a, exactly what we're trying to do. It's maybe not exploring all of the grapes because we don't want to risk uh, just overwhelming consumers with all the different types of grapes. But I guess using, using a metaphor, um, that that makes sense this time of the year with the World Cup going on. It's like for, for us, the Quebranta and the Italia are, are two goalposts, right? It's the two sides of the spectrum. Within those two goalposts, we're going to start exploring different products, um, both in terms of terroir. So right now we are working on a Quebranta that's uh, from the coast, as I mentioned, that we're currently selling in Peru and the States it hasn't been released yet. And that allows you to compare two Quebrantas from the same valley, different vineyards, and be able to explore the taste differences. So that's one route that we're going to grow. The other route is having unique releases that are not not common at all. We want to go for the really uncommon, innovative uh, um, types of grapes. For example, two that we have in mind, for example, are looking at Negra Criolla, which is a is one of the first grapes that the Spanish brought to Peru. So it's pretty much the father of of all of all grapes in in Pisco. And figuring out uh, the purest expression of that Negra Criolla, right? So that will be our um, probably our next batch. And then we also want to explore different regions, like go to the to the both extremes of the denomination of origin. And explore what pisco tastes like in the southernmost point of Peru and the northernmost point of Lima, right? And uh, the beauty of our model is that we're not bound to any geographical area because we work with multiple DOs. So, for example, if we were bound to the Ica denomination of origin as a brand, all of our grapes would need to be sourced from Ica, 
So we wouldn't have the 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 opportunity to explore piscos from different regions. The way our model works, it's completely decentralized. We partner with producers from different regions, and that allows us to to serve as a as a vehicle for education and sharing of different pieces. Um, hope that answered your question, Alex. Anything else on the horizon for us? Yeah, a, a lot on the horizon, <laughs> but maybe just to elaborate on, on on one point you made there with with the goalposts, Eric. We we very uh, deliberately chose uh, what we believe to be, you know, sort of in our opinions, the the least aromatics of the non aromatics in the quebranta, and then the most aromatic of the aromatics in the Italia, so that we could sort of fill in the blanks in between. But um, you know, ultimately, what I think in, underpins so much of what we do is uh, the lack of education and, and awareness about the pisco category. So it's 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 a really uh, it, it's a delicate situation where we we want to because we you know we we try so many unique and fun things we want to release everything but it's it's challenging to be able to introduce all of these things to the consumer at the same time and expect them to know what's going on or even you know one year after the other we have to make sure that we're really driving home the key points that we want so that consumers you, you know better than we do how it's easy to get flooded with information and get confused and. You know, you're you're an expert. Think about the uh, the average spirits consumer and how difficult it is for them to, under, to to pick up on something new. And not no fault of theirs. It's just there's simply too many options uh, out there. So we want to make sure that we're, uh, we're we're very tactfully releasing subsequent batches. And uh, you know, the, the limited the limited batch way is a good way for us to sort of gauge gauge consumer demand. But you know, sort of as we look into, uh, you know, one thing we, we, we talk about a lot is what's the next phase for us as we look out into the future. It's everything that we do has to lead with education, 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 because we simply we, we simply can't afford to lose consumers because we didn't give them enough information. Um, so that's yeah, it's, it's, it's awareness. That's everything that we do needs to be focused around awareness. And that's part of why we think these conversations are so fun. Yeah. Well, uh, for those of you who uh, have not seen the Suyo label, obviously there's a lot of transparency and education just to be found right on the label in terms of what's in the bottle. Obviously the implications of the elevation and the, you know, the bottling strength and, and the grape varietals need to be, you know, kind of left up to, you know, your palate and your ability to understand what Pisco is and means. But the nice thing is you guys are really transparent on your labels and, you know, that I think is the hallmark of any good single origin product is to be able to pick it up and have some sense of what people are trying to present to you. Um, I think I, I do have a couple of uh, ideas for you guys. I can, we can maybe chat after we record here. I've got a couple of um, couple of ideas. Maybe uh, I know. Uh, one of your markets is New York, so I had a couple ideas there. But maybe I can I can throw you just a, a few ideas of how to uh, you know throw some of the smaller batches out with a little bit less less risk in in the game because I know that obviously the taking taking something that was made in Peru, bringing it all the way here to the U.S. and then having it sit on shelves and not sell is is, is not something that that uh, is is a exciting prospect. So I, I can <laughs> understand the risk in in that. But before we jump into any of the the lightning round questions here, is there is there anything that you want to make sure our listeners um, know before we uh, before we do uh, specifically, I guess where where they can pick up a bottle. Yeah. So, uh, boy, a lot of things. So where they can pick up a bottle, we, uh, as you said, we are, uh, predominantly, uh, available in New York right now. So we, we, we launched, so to speak in the U S I would say, uh, spring of this year. And we started off with New York, uh, New York city more specifically, but we are available in upstate New York and a number of places as well. We're in, uh, California on and off premise. So you can go to some liquor stores and, uh, bars and restaurants. All of that information is available on our website. But I would say for the vast majority of listeners who I suspect are, are sprinkled around the country on our website is, is likely the best option. Uh, we, we recently partnered with a, a liquor store in Brooklyn that uh, we are, we've become very good friends with called Fiasco, uh, who uh, I think you know, I, I saw you actually did a show with Ivy Mix a couple of years ago. She's, she's part owner in Fiasco and they've just been really good friends to us. So yeah. they're able to sh- ship nationwide. So uh, anyone can go to our website, click buy now and it'll take you directly to their website. 
Amazing. Amazing. Uh, Ian, anything else that uh, we want to make sure our listeners know about Suyo or about Pisco? Um, it was invented in um, Chile, right? <laughs> that's that's where I was going next with this, but uh, I'll, I'll let you. I think I'll let you in take a stab at this one. Yeah, you know, I I just feel Peruvian pisco producer and Chilean pisco producers have uh, spent too much time arguing over the pisco category when it's based on how you make it. It's just two completely different spirits, right? It's it's, it's like saying that Armagnac is the same thing as cognac. It's not. Sure. Um, I I don't get into that fight. I think as a category, we're better off uh, promoting the category and educating. Uh, but what I would like to highlight is that there's, I learn more things about B-Skill every single day. There's a lot of information out there uh, and it's difficult to get a hold of that information. It's not readily available. So anyone that's curious and Eric, you can give my email, Alex's email out afterwards. Anyone that's curious either what to make with it, where it comes, what's in it, where to get it, shoot us a note. Uh, I think Alex and I are here to be advocates for the category, not only your brand, um, and we're really passionate about it. So we love talking to everyone about it. Awesome. Uh, And I was going to, yeah, I was going to save that for the end, but totally just second that. Yes, we email, uh, you can, you can DM us on Instagram. It's always Ian or myself who responds and we love having these conversations and, um, just, just to reiterate on that Chilean Pisco concept that we're, we're not just blowing smoke. We, we fundamentally believe that what's best for uh, the Pisco category is that we educate on the differences between the two rather than fight about who owns it. So, you know, you, you think about Chilean Pisco, it's different grape, completely different process, can distill many times, and then you can, you can age it as well. So you end up with something that's completely different. No one's going to say whether it's better or worse. It's simply different. So as long as consumers understand and appreciate that, I think we'd be in a happy place. Gotcha. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. So with that, let's jump into the lightning round here. The first question we like to ask is you get you get a desert island scenario. Interpret that however you want. Maybe you're there for the rest of your life. Maybe you, you're simply there for a long time. Uh, you get one bottle of any spirit, anything in the world, and then you get one cocktail, kind of like if you could have like a, an on draft like cocktail. What is your bottle and what is your cocktail, Ian? Yeah, so Desert Island for me just screams hot weather. So we need to go for a very refreshing cocktail. I'd, I'd go for a Chilcano, which is ginger ale and pisco. Um, keep it fresh, nothing else. Maybe some citrus peel in it just to to wake up some of those citrusy aromas and the spirit. I mean, a Chicano is made with Pisco. So I, I definitely go with Pisco, but I would go with a, and the DO might, might ban me uh, for saying this, but I would go with a, with a Pisco that's overproof. So above the 48% alcohol that's allowed to make Pisco, because I might need it to light something on fire, you know? So I, I might just need like a 50, <laughs> 55 degree, 53, 55% alcohol Pisco and go with that. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I, I like the, uh, I like the survivalist accelerant, uh, <laughs> affordance there. Uh, Alex. I'm going to go survivalist on this one too. I think we're, <laughs> we're thinking about this a little too pragmatically, but, um, I'm going to go with the Pisco tonic because, okay. yeah. um, uh, as you likely know, Pisco tonic is our tonic waters made from quinine, which mm-hmm. comes from the Chinchona bark, which is uh, native to Peru and, uh, was, uh, first discovered as a, as a treatment for malaria. So, if we're in tropical weather, there's likely going to be mosquitoes and I might be at risk for malaria. So mm-hmm. the tonic will help help combat that. So that's going to be my <laughs> my cocktail. And look, there's nothing more Peruvian than a Pisco tonic. So I'm going to be excited to be drinking that. And then um, if I had a bottle or something, I, I may be bending the rules a little bit here. So let me know if this isn't valid. But uh, uh, I'm going to go with a, a Mistela, which uh, you may or may not be familiar with. It's... Um, it's, it's like a fortified Peruvian wine. So what we do is we take uh, uh, grape juice that's uh, n- not, not fermented yet. And then we mix it with, with Pisco and we arrive at something that's typically in the, the high teens alcohol. So mm. I think it could be really sippable uh, yeah. if I just have it in the bottle, almost like, like a, a higher proof wine. That's going to be something I can, yeah. I can sip all the time. I don't know if that's technically a spirit, but 
No, I, I like I like that it. though. I like it. It's kind of like you know, it's it's uh, it's in it's in the sort of like the Port Madeira conversation. Exactly. Right? Yeah. No, I, I like that a lot. Um, <laughs> all right. Uh, next question: Cocktail with anybody in the world, past or present? Who would it be? Where would you go? What would you drink? Just paint us a picture. Alex, you want to go for it? I'll go next. I'm gonna go with a uh, <laughs> sticking on the the bisco bisco tonic because I've already sort of think anchored on that one i'm gonna go with uh freddie mercury if i'm maybe i'll go two different scenarios so uh freddie mercury because i read somewhere that his favorite drink was am i allowed to pick people who yeah. have passed yeah, I forgot past present, that. Yeah. okay um i heard he was a fan of of a vodka tonic so i'd mm. like to introduce him to the, the pisco tonic in case he hasn't had that before and i'm gonna go two different scenarios uh so mm-hmm. I, I like that because I've, I've always been a huge, huge fan of Freddie Mercury's Queen is one of my favorite rock bands of all time. And, uh, you know, Freddie Mercury, of course, is just an icon and it's just done so many amazing things uh, for social issues that exist to this day and just a really, really amazing person. But um, so that would be kind of like my fun one. And then I, I think maybe somewhat more generically and relevant today, I would say uh, a beer with Barack Obama mm. simply because I know he used to brew his own beer when he was in the White House. I'm sure he still does. And I would love to just sit down and have a beer with that guy uh, in the white house. If I could go back in time. Yeah. Can you imagine like there must've been a situation where like he had a bad batch or like he let it go too long and it like overflowed and spilled everywhere. And like the white house staff just walked in on it and was just like, Barack, <laughs> come on, man. Like, like that's, that, that's the part of like presidencies that I like thinking about. Like I like thinking about the stuff yeah. that they're doing when they're not doing all the important stuff. Um, that's a great <laughs> answer. Ian, what, what do you got for us? Um, I think I'd go for a Hemingway Daiquiri with Hemingway himself. <laughs> Fun fact: He so he he used to live in live in Cuba for for a bit, right? But he also went to Peru and um, had this big impossible task of of um, fishing the biggest marlin out of um, out of the north of Peru, out of Cabo Blanco. So I'd, I think it'd be a Hemingway day curie on a boat fishing marlins. And maybe swap some pisco in there instead of the rum. Yeah, who knows? Yeah, yeah, I like that. I like that. <laughs> you gotta be you gotta be careful though, because if you do a little research on that, the Hemingway daiquiri that we all know and love is not what he made the bartender make him, which was like served in a pint glass. It was it was more his his what he drank was more of like the Long Island iced tea version, which is like all booze and like a little, a little bit of grapefruit juice. So be careful be, if you're when you're on that boat with him. Just be make sure you know what you're getting. Oh, he um, he definitely out tricked me. I would need to to swap it for water every other drink or something. Yeah, yeah. And to, to which point, fun uh, debatable fact uh it's been documented somewhere that uh ernest hemingway holds the record for most pisco sours ever consumed in one setting i uh, unconfirmed but that information exists so make of that what okay. you will okay hemingway <laughs> hemingway pisco sours um i'm gonna have to look that up i'm making a note right now most consumed <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to see if I can get to the uh, get to the bottom of that one. That's fascinating. Well, gentlemen, uh, this has been a super fun conversation, mostly because of your company, but certainly enhanced by these two beautiful spirits uh, that we were able to sample today. I think as a concept, it's a really exciting one to me, not just because I have a proclivity for unaged grape distillates, but because I think the mission and the project is something that is going to resonate with a lot of people the more and more you get it out there. So thank you for choosing the Modern Bar Cart Podcast as, as a way to, to, to do that. And um, thank you for being awesome guests and educators. Thanks for having us, Eric. It's a lot of fun. Thank you, Eric. Yep. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Hey, everybody. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, there's two big things you can do for us here at Modern Bar Cart. One would be to tell your friends and family if you think they'd enjoy listening to us talk about cocktails. And if they don't download podcasts, they can always stream our episodes on their desktop directly from the show notes page at modernbarcart.com. The other thing you can do to help would be to head on over to iTunes or wherever you download your podcasts 
and leave us a review. Five stars are great, but we're more interested in your feedback. And the beauty is, the more reviews we have, the easier it will be for other folks out there to learn about our show. We're trying to start a cocktail revolution here, and by spreading the word, you're helping us fight the good fight. You can always reach us by emailing podcast at modernbarcart.com if you're looking for cocktail or bartending advice, or if you're a pro who would like to pull up a mic and be interviewed for all to hear. Also, definitely follow us on Instagram and Facebook at Modern Bar Cart for cocktail porn, recipes, and entertaining tips. And keep an eye out for new product releases and special offers, which are happening all the time. We love our listeners, and we really enjoy giving you exclusive discounts and sneak peeks at our latest and greatest cocktail projects. This episode may be over, but for you, the mixological fun and adventures are just beginning. So remember, folks, drink responsibly and experiment boldly. This episode was made possible with editing and sound design by Samantha Reed. Pisco Insights, courtesy of Alex Hildebrandt and Ian Leggett, and a little bit of interview magic by yours truly. This has been a Modern Bar Cart production, copyright 2022.